Okay, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, this is a meeting of Faith, Film, and Philosophy. Well, in fact, welcome to the first event of Faith, Film, Philosophy series for 2023. Our focus is on the topic multiverses and alternative realities, other worlds in film. I'm excited to begin this series of events um, that explore the links between philosophical and theological issues as they appear in popular film, particularly the set of recent films that employ themes of multiverses and alternative realities as a significant narrative device. This series of events is organized by the Gonzaga Faith and Reason Institute, of which I am currently serving as director. The Institute is dedicated to developing an integrationist understanding of faith and reason, particularly as articulated in the Catholic intellectual tradition. The Institute does this in several main areas. First, science, nature, and philosophical theology, both historically and in the present. Second, philosophical reflection on the existence and nature of God. Third, attention to the problem of evil and suffering. And fourth, the cultural and social impact of Christianity. The present series on faith, film, and philosophy is an instance of the last of these emphases attending to the cultural place of Christian ideas as they appear in popular culture or as they provide a lens for critically examining popular culture. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the friends and donors whose support makes events supported by the Institute possible. The Institute is generously supported by the Father uh, Robert J. Spitzer Society of Jesus Leadership Fund, which was created when Father Robert Spitzer retired as Gonzaga's president in 2009. A great number of friends of Father Spitzer and of Gonzaga University have contributed to this fund over the years. The Institute is deeply grateful for their support and indebted to all of them for the gifts that make events like tonight's talk possible. The idea of multiple universes existing simultaneously has roots in both philosophical reflections on possible worlds and contemporary physical cosmology, but it's become a major theme in recent popular films, such as the 2023 Oscar winner, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, which our speaker uh, tonight will be addressing, and also several of the other speakers later in the week will be talking about that film and movies in the Marvel Universe, which the speaker on the final night of our event series on Friday will address. These explorations of other cinematic worlds join older films that explore various forms of alternate possible paths of action, such as the classic Run Lola Run, a film that will be the subject of a free screening and panel discussion tomorrow night, uh, virtual realities of the Matrix and the Westworld series, imaginary worlds of fantasy films such as Avatar, alternative history explorations such as The Man in the High Castle, and films such as Total Recall that combine different forms of alternative reality. What motivates cinematic interest in alternative realities, especially at this particular historical moment? Do multiverse and alternative reality films reflect fears of possible dystopias far worse than the world we inhabit? Better possibilities to inspire us? Variant duplications of the world that we find more intriguing than mundane reality? I'm extraordinarily pleased that our first scholar to address these questions is my friend, former colleague, and the prior director of the Gonzaga Faith and Reason Institute, Dr. Brian B. Clayton. Dr. Clayton was a member of the Gonzaga Philosophy Department for 30 some odd years. I uh, asked him earlier this afternoon and found out it was 36 to be exact. Uh, he was a member of the Philosophy Department for 36 years until his retirement just last spring. He was a master teacher of a number of specialties, including philosophy of human nature in the university core and advanced courses in faith and reason, film, and Walker Percy. His senior level course on C.S. Lewis was legendary as a deep dive with tons of reading uh, into the complexities of Lewis's fiction, philosophical theology, and reflections on culture and literature. 
As the former head of the Gonzaga Faith and Reason Institute, Dr. Clayton was the founder of the Faith, Film, and Philosophy series, which he helmed successfully for a decade until it went into suspension like so many things during the COVID era. He is co-author uh, co of a book on faith and reason titled Two Wings and was the co-editor of a collection of essays on the philosophy of Clint Eastwood that grew organically from papers that were a part of the Faith Film Philosophy Seminar over the years. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Clayton back to the Gonzaga campus to present his talk, It's a Wonderful Life in the Multiverse. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for the kind words. It is great to be back here. Uh, we've moved from here to Texas, where every day this summer is at least 100 degrees. The heat index ranged from 110 to 120. And uh, I'm just enjoying the weather and the beautiful scenery. But it's certainly nice to be back here um, at Gonzaga, where I spent so much time. Um, I want to thank. Thanks, why don't I hang you up for the day? Sure. I can't tell what it's doing. Maybe let's get that a little close, okay? I want to thank uh, David and the rest of the executive committee for organizing this week. Uh, I really appreciate all the work that David has done, uh, having done it a few times myself. And uh, I appreciate the help of the other committee members and uh, Liz Evans, who's the secretary in the philosophy department and Carter Bushy, who is the assistant to uh, Dr. Calhoun, I just met today. Uh, thank you uh, for all the hard work uh, that you put into this. Um, Tonight, I want to look at two different films. It's a Wonderful Life from 1946 and Everything Everywhere All at Once from 2022. This might seem a surprising pairing of films because on the surface, they seem so different from each other. And in fact, they really are very different from each other. But they are also connected by some intriguing similarities. For example, both films are fantasy comedies, or maybe better, dramedies. At their heart, both films are about families. Immigrant experience and the American dream are important in both films. The protagonists in both the films are very similar to one another. Both George Bailey and Evelyn Wong uh, are facing uh, financial crises. George is facing an audit from a bank examiner and Evelyn is undergoing an audit from an IRS agent. Moreover, moreover, Evelyn and George are each dealing with personal crises over their failure to live the life each had envisioned at an earlier age. They both experience their current life as stifling and inhibiting and fear that that life might be pointless. Evelyn and George are each dealing with a family in crisis, and the crises have their origin in the respective protagonists. Furthermore, in both films, suicide is being seriously considered as a way of dealing with crisis. Of course, in It's a Wonderful Life, it is George who is contemplating suicide. Uh, and in everything all at once, it is Evelyn's daughter who is at risk. But it remains the case that the possibility of suicide is the backdrop against which the dramedy in each film is acted out. And of course, in both films, the protagonists receive unexpected help that involves alternate realities that enable them to avert the disaster of suicide. All these similarities aside though, it is true that the films are very different in tone, style, and substance. Everything, everywhere, all at once, is chaotic, and the chaos is driven by the film's villain, Jopu, Jopu Topaki. And It's a Wonderful Life, the crises arise in the context of ordinary 
and largely ordered life. In It's a Wonderful Life, the unexpected help comes from a transcendent reality, whereas in Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, it comes complements of modern physics, whether from string theory or inflationary cosmology. These differences are especially important for the evaluation of these films. I will argue that one of these films is more successful than the other. Now, this is probably a good point at which to say something very briefly about my approach to watching films. I take from C.S. Lewis, surprise, surprise, the view that our first obligation in experiencing art or in experiencing nature is to be receptive. Lewis writes in an experiment in criticism, the first demand of any work of any art, the first demand it makes upon us is surrender. Look, listen, receive, get yourself out of the way. There's no good asking first whether the work before you deserves such a surrender, or until you have surrendered, you cannot possibly find out. But watching a film is more like listening to music than it is looking at a painting or a photograph. Because like music, the action of the film is extended in time. Thus, one may well not get the film or get the point of the film, what the film is trying to do or to say on the first viewing of the film. And unlike a novel or a poem that is static on the page, one cannot simply turn back a page or two to reread a passage that seems to have new significance in light of something that appears later. With the film, one cannot go back to earlier scenes, especially if one is watching in a theater. Thus, really to watch a film often requires multiple viewings. And one mark of a good film, it seems to me, is that on successive viewings, one discovers more and more of significance. Finally, one should attempt to receive the film in the spirit in which it was intended to be seen, although the intent might not be readily evident, especially on first view. Only once one thinks one has a handle on what the film is trying to do or say, can, can, can one then ask more evaluative questions such as, how well does the film do what it's trying to do? Does it succeed in its own terms? Is it attempting, is what it is attempting to do worth doing? Is what it is attempting to do to me something that ought to be done to me? In what follows, I am attempt, attempting to spell out with respect to It's a Wonderful Life and everything, everywhere, all at once, what I think the films are trying to do. How well I think they do this and whether or not or not, I think that what they are attempting to do is worth doing. So we'll start with It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, show of hands, people familiar with It's a Wonderful Life? Okay. I apologize for putting details in here. Just to remind you, uh, the director of the film was Frank Capra, he came out in 1946. Capra immigrated with his family from Sicily in 1903 when he was five years old. His own involvement with Hollywood began in the mid-1920s, and by the 1930s, he was directing his own films. He had a series of major successes, beginning with It Happened One Night in 1934, which won all five major Oscars, Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Adapted Screenplay. Other notable Capra films from this era were Mr. Deeds Goes to Town in 1936, you Can't Take It With You, 1938. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington in 1939 and Meet John Doe in 1941. He was nominated for Best Director for several of these films and won the Oscar for two of them. During uh, the Second World War, Capra joined the military and made a film series entitled Why We Fight. Uh, the intent of the series was to promote US troop morale. After the war, he and three partners formed Liberty Pictures, which wound up making only two movies, the first of which was It's a Wonderful Life. The film did well critically 
and at the box office. It was nominated for both Best Picture and Best Director. But the film's box office did not cover its high production costs, effectively dooming Liberty Pictures. The film itself got a second chance at life in the 1970s when the copyright was allowed to lapse. Uh, and so the film entered the public domain. TV stations were able to show it without having to pay licensing and royalty fees. And so a whole new generation of viewers was introduced to the film. It's now part of the American collective psyche. You will recall that the film begins with nighttime, nighttime scenes of the fictional town of Bedford Falls, New York. As we see the snow falling, we hear various prayers. Mr. Gower, I owe everything to George Bailey. Help him, dear father. Mr. Martini, Joseph, Jesus, and Mary, help my friend, Mr. Bailey. Mrs. Bailey, his mother, help my son to me. Bert the cop, he never thinks about himself, God. That's why he's in trouble. Ernie the taxi driver, George is a good guy. Give him a break, God. Mary Bailey, I love him. This is his wife, dear Lord. Watch over him tonight. The camera then pulls up to show us the field of stars above. And we hear voices speaking accompanied by the twinkling of particular stars, which represent angels. One angel tells the other, its superior, that there are a lot of prayers being said for George Bailey. It turns out that the angels know that tonight is a crucial night in the life of George Bailey and that he will require their special assistance not to commit suicide. Unfortunately, the angel on call, so to speak, is Clarence Oddbody, AS2, angel second class. Even though they know that Clarence is not the sharpest tool in the shed and that he has not yet earned his wings, the supervising angels assign him to take care of George. The first hour or more of the film consists of the supervising angels showing Clarence key events in George's life culminating with the events on Christmas Eve, 1945, that have brought George to the point of contemplating suicide. As George stands on a bridge, looking down into the icy waters of the river below and preparing to jump, Clarence hurls past him into the river and jumps in. Without thinking, George strips off his winter overcoat and plunges into the river to rescue Clarence. As Clarence and George dry off afterwards in the bridge toll keeper's toll house, Clarence tells George that he is his guardian angel, come to save him from committing suicide. George, of course, does not believe him. But at one point in their conversation, George says that his family would be better off if he were dead. But then he amends this to say that everyone would be better off if he had never been born. Clarence gets his superior's approval and shows George the alternate reality of what the world would be like had he not been born. The result is that George comes to recognize that he has had a wonderful life and embraces that life, even if it means that he will be bankrupted, disgraced, and imprisoned. Clarence has earned his wings. George is back with his family and friends, and the crisis has been resolved. The audience is relieved and happy. They have had their heartstring tugged and quietly shed a few tears every single time. Our hero has survived and goodness has triumphed. Now recall that our first duty as viewers is to receive and to try to figure out what a film is trying to do or say. But it is true that part of the point of this film is to affirm the triumph of the good. This triumph means little if the obstacles overcome have been insignificant. Properly to appreciate the significance of the obstacles, it is necessary to pay attention to the darknesses of the film. First, there's the darkness of the theme, despair leading to contemplation of suicide. This is quite literally a life and death matter. One of the angels tells Clarence that at exactly 10.45 p.m. tonight, Earth time, I'm not sure what time zone it is, uh, George will be thinking seriously of throwing away God's greatest gift. So it is eternity that is at stake. For Capra, who was raised in a Roman Catholic family, 
and whose religious sensibilities are evident throughout the film, uh, even though he himself is not the most devout of Catholics. Uh, it would be natural to present suicide as having eternal significance. Secondly, there's the visual darkness of the film. The film is shot, as you know, in black and white. So one would expect that darkness, that, that, that darkness would be accentuated. But if one looks at the key events in George's life as they are shown to Clarence, at least four of them seem to be set in gloom or night. The first of these is when news of Peter Bailey's stroke reaches George while he and Mary are walking home in the dark after Harry's graduation party. A second key event associated with darkness occurs on the night of Harry's return from college. A restless George goes by Mary's house and winds up declaring his love for her. The third event is the day of George and Mary's wedding and how it is affected by a run in the bank. Rain seems to be pouring down all day long. And when George finally returns to their new home, it is in darkness. Finally, the interactions with Clarence all happen at night. So in my memory, at least, the film is visually dim and dark, punctuated by occasional brightness. Third, there is a spiritual or psychological darkness of the film. And this is the most noteworthy darkness. Spiritual darkness is most evident in Henry F. Potter, who one of the angels identifies as the richest and meanest man in the county. Potter is the nemesis of the Bailey family and their building and loan. He is especially the nemesis of George Bailey. The darkness in Potter is evident in almost everything he says or does throughout the film. For example, early on in the film, we get this exchange between uh, Potter and Peter Bailey, head of the building and loan, and George's father. Potter asks, have you put any real pressure on those people of yours to pay those mortgages? Peter Bailey, times are bad, Mr. Potter. A lot of these people are out of work. Then foreclose. Can't do that. These families have children. They're not my children, but they're somebody's children. Are you running a business or a charity here? Now, those who have seen the film can think of numerous other instances where Potter evidences an indifference to the welfare of his fellow citizens. He is, perhaps, a bit cartoonish in his unyielding malevolence. But this only strengthens the contrast with George Bailey. George Bailey seems to be the soul of charity. He genuinely cares about the living conditions of his fellow townspeople. He goes out of his way to assist them even to the point of endangering his own financial security. Thus, it comes as something of a shock to recognize that a similar darkness, although largely hidden, is also present in George. This every man, friend to the immigrant, friend to the working people of Bedford Falls, caring father, faithful husband, loyal son, brother, nephew, cousin, friend. It is George's darkness that is particularly significant. And to understand the darkness, to grasp this, we should remind ourselves of George's character, his temperament, his personality. Then we can look to see how George is affected by and responds to the crucial events in his life as they are shown to his guardian angel, Clarence. On the one hand, George has a keen sense of right and wrong. His, his father provides for him a model of trying always to do what is right. He is courageous, willing to do what is right, even if it is personally painful and difficult. George is also compassionate, especially with respect to those who are less fortunate or who are outsiders. He is dutiful and loyal, especially to family and friends, but also with respect to the wider Bedford Falls community. And all of these virtues contribute to the stability and well-being of family and community. On the other hand, he has his own distinctive desires and interests. Early in the film, George, 12-year-old George, tells eight-year-old Mary that he will go out exploring someday and have a couple of harems and maybe three or four wives. He wants to travel, especially to foreign and exotic lands. He also wants to make 
a mark on the world, to do something big and significant. We discover this when, on the night before he is supposed to leave for Europe and then to college, 21-year-old George tells his father that he wants to build things, design new buildings, plan modern cities, and that he cannot wait to get away from Bedford Falls and the shabby little office in the building in London. Later that same evening, having thrown a rock and broken glass in the derelict, derelict Granville house, an accomplishment which local lore says will result in a wish being granted, he tells Mary Hatch about the wish he had made before throwing it. Well, not just one wish, a whole hat full, Mary. I know what I'm going to do tomorrow and the next day and the next year and the year after that. I'm shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet and I'm going to see the world. Italy, Greece, the Parthenon, the Colosseum. Then I'm coming back here and go to college and see what they know. I always laugh at that line, having talk college. And then I'm going to build, I'm going to build airfields. I'm going to build skyscrapers 100 stories high. I'm going to build bridges a mile long. But George is a man at war with himself. By character and upbringing, he is well suited to being a good citizen of Bedford Falls. But by temperament and passions, he is restless, wanting to leave Bedford Falls behind him. He is dissatisfied with what he has and wants something more and other. He desires to travel, which requires leaving family and community. He desires to do big things, to make a noticeable difference in the wider world, which will probably also require that he leave family and home community. It is easy to see how his desires to do great things and make a name for himself might come to be in tension with his character, his loyalty to family, friends, and community. We can observe this, the development of this tension in the episodes that the angelic superiors show to Clarence. There are five groups of episodes that can be identified by the year they occur. In 1919, in 1919, George saves the life of his eight-year-old younger brother, Terry when Harry falls through thin ice and into the river's freezing water. George immediately jumps in to rescue Harry and calls for his friends to form a chain and pull them out. George's heroism is known by others, but it has a cost. He loses the hearing in one ear. We learn later that this hearing loss prevents him from serving in the military in the Second World War, service that would have given him an opportunity to prove his mettle and to make a name for himself. Later that year, or early the next, George returns to his job in Mr. Gower's drugstore. George sees that the inebriated Mr. Gower has mistakenly filled pills with poison, pills intended for a child suffering from diphtheria, but he is unable to get the druggist to listen to him. Unable to get adult assistance in dealing with Gower, George returns to the drugstore where Gower boxes his ears for failing to deliver the medicine. And so his injured ear, there's blood coming out of the ear. When George gets Gower finally to listen to him, the two tearfully embrace. George tells Gower that he will never tell anyone what almost happened. George's is a private heroism, known only to George, Gower, and the angels in heaven. The next two episodes take place in 1928, so 1919, 1928. Since his high school graduation, George has been working with his father, uh, Uncle Billy, and other extended family members in the Bailey Building in Rome. For the good of the family, he has delayed his travel and postponed his college education. But today is the day of Brother Harry's high school graduation party. And, uh, and the day before George begins his long delayed travels, he can finally pursue his dreams and do what he has been wanting to do for so many years. It is at dinner that night that George tells his father that he wants to travel, go to college and then build things. George, George largely repeats this de declaration while talking with Mary Hatch on the walk home from the dance. The plan is for George to go to college and for Harry to take his place for four years at the building and loan, after which Harry can go to college. The talk with Mary is brought to an abrupt end, though, 
when Harry and Uncle Billy show up to get George to come home. His father has had a stroke. In the next episode, we learn that Peter Bailey has died and that George has given up his travel plans and postponed his college education once again. In a meeting at the board of the building and loan, Potter moves to dissolve it. In Potter's view, Peter Bailey was the building and loan, and with him gone, the building and loan no longer exists or need exist. George offers a spirited defense of his father's character and of the need for the building and loan as providing an alternative to Potter's high price slum housing in Potter's Field. The board votes not to dissolve the building and loan on the condition that George take his father's place. George gives his college money to Harry and stays in town for another four years. Again, circumstances have combined to frustrate George's plans and desires. Four years later, 1932, we see George and Uncle Billy meeting the train on which Harry Bailey is returning to Bedford Falls after having graduated from college where he received acclaim as a second team All-American football player. By agreement, Harry is returning home to take over for George, who will be free to leave Bedford Falls. Harry surprises the family with the news that he has married, and his young wife lets slip that her father has offered Harry a research position that promises a bright future. Although Harry expresses his willingness to keep to his agreement with George, George does not want to hold back Harry. Jimmy Stewart does a wonderful job of displaying non-verbally George's restlessness, frustration, and growing anger, especially when George, at his mother's suggestion, visits Mary Hatch at her house. She, too, has returned from college, so she's gotten away from Bedford Falls and come back, and she's um, joyful at seeing George. George, however, is passive-aggressive in his interaction with Mary. In spite of the anger seething just below the surface, though, it's clear that George has strong feelings for Mary. He angrily tells her, I don't want to get married ever to anyone. You understand that? I want to do what I want to do. This is followed by a passionate embrace and kiss. The next scene is several months later when we see George and Mary on their very rainy wedding day. When Ernie, the taxi driver, takes them away from the Bailey house, they pull out the sizable wad of cash they receive as a wedding gift, and George announces their plans. You know what we're going to do? We're going to shoot the works. A whole week in New York, a whole week in Bermuda, the highest hotels, the oldest champagne, the richest caviar, the hottest music, and the prettiest wife. However, as they pass through town, they see many people rushing to the bank and others gathering outside the locked building alone. There's been a run on the bank, which threatens to spill over to the Bailey building and loan. George stops the taxi, rushes into the building and loan, and tries to calm things down. People obviously need their money to cover expenses, but Uncle Billy has had to give all the building and loans cash to the bank when their loans were called. Mary comes to the rescue by bringing in the wedding gift money, and George distributes it to the building and loan customers. At the end of the day, George returns in the rain to the rundown home that Mary has begun fixing up. So much for the highest hotels and for the cash they have been given. George is bound to Bedford Falls more firmly than ever. Still more frustration for George. According to the script, the next episodes are set two years later, 1934. The first scene is of the immigrant Martini family moving from their house in Potter's Slum to a new home in Bailey Park, financed through the Bailey Building and Loan. The Baileys welcome the Martinis to their new home, and the Martinis cross themselves. Um, Mary gives them gifts of bread, salt, and wine, and the Martinis cross themselves with each gift. It's noteworthy that apart from the prayers and the angel voices at the beginning of the film, this is only the second instance of any religious practice of the as the heart housewarming is going on, Sam Wainwright, 
an old friend of George and Mary Bailey, drives up in a fancy chauffeur-driven car. George is not particularly glad to see Sam, who has had great success in New York City. In fact, it is clear that he is envious of Sam's success, which draws George's attention to his own failure to do big things and to succeed outside of Bedford Falls. After the Wainwrights drive away, George walks back to his beat up 1919 Dodge car and kicks the door. Shortly thereafter, Potter invites George to meet him at his office where he is offered a three year contract at 20,000 a year, which doesn't sound like much or anything these days, of course. But it's a significant raise from George's current salary of $2,300 per year. Potter says of George, in the third person, George Bailey is not a common, ordinary yokel. He's an intelligent, smart, ambitious young man who hates his job, who hates the building and loan almost as much as I do. A young man who's been dying to get out on his own ever since he was born. A young man, the smartest one of the crowd, mind you, a young man who has to sit and watch his friends go places because he's trapped. Yes, trapped into frittering his life away playing nursemaid to a lot of garlic. Potter is telling the truth. But George comes to himself and angrily rejects Potter's offer. You sit around here and you spend your little webs and you think the whole world revolves around you and your money. Well, it doesn't, Mr. Potter. In the whole vast configuration of things, I'd say you were nothing but a scurvy little spot. George returns home to learn from Mary that she is pregnant with the first of what will be turn out to be four children. Bedford Falls tightens its grip on the restless George. There's then a montage of scenes concerning George, Mary, and their friends during the Second World War. George fought the Battle of uh, Bedford Falls. Civil defense. We learned that along with so many others, George wept and prayed on VE Day and again on VJ Day. It's the third instance of religious practice. We come to Christmas Eve, 1945, when the conflict within George comes to the crisis point. Harry Bailey has been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor and is scheduled to arrive in town soon for a celebration. George is the proud big brother. He moves through the brightly sunlit, snow-covered Bedford Falls streets with copies of the local paper whose headline announces Harry's honor. It is a great day for the Bailey family, but disaster looms. Forgetful Uncle Billy misplaces $8,000 he is supposed to deposit in the building and loans account at the bank. He has inadvertently left it wrapped in Potter's newspaper. When George arrives at the office, ignorant of what has happened, he meets the bank examiner who has come to audit the books. Soon George is retracing Uncle Billy's steps without success. George loses his temper and angrily yells at Uncle Billy. Where's that money, you stupid, silly old fool? Where's the money? Do you realize what this means? It means bankruptcy and scandal in prison. That's what it means. One of us is going to, is going to jail. Well, it's not going to be me. When he returns home, he does not tell Mary what is going on, but lashes out at her and the children, and on the phone at Mrs. Welch, uh, his daughter Zuzu's teacher. Once the children gets the children in tears, George leaves and he goes to Potter's office where he asks for help alone. Potter refuses and says, you used to be so cocky. You were going to go out and conquer the world. You once called me a warped, frustrated old man. What are you but a warped, frustrated young man? A miserable little clerk crawling in here on your hands and knees and begging for help. No securities, no stocks, no bonds, nothing but a miserable little $500 equity in a life insurance policy. You're worth more dead than a lot. Now again, Potter has spoken the truth. There is a part of George of which it is true to say that he is a warped, frustrated young man. George leaves and goes to the bar in Martini's restaurant, where after a few drinks, he prays, God, God, dear Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you can hear me, show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope. Show me the way. 
fourth mention of religious practice. Another man at the bar, hearing that this is George Bailey, sucker punches him. He is the husband of Mrs. Welch, the teacher whom George had abused on the phone. George takes this as a sign of God's abandon, a perverse answer to his prayer asking for guidance. George leaves the bar, drives his car into a tree, walks out onto the bridge in the snowy darkness, and prepares to kill himself. It is at this point that Clarence intervenes. The darkness that is in George Bailey is his frustration and anger at not being able to do what he wants to do. He is restless. He wants to travel. He wants to build things, air, airfields, bridges, and buildings. Large things that connect with his desire to travel and his desire to be recognized for doing something important. Instead, he has been tied down to Bedford Falls for his entire life and faces what appears to be a lifelong situation of tight money. <clears throat> he will never be rich or successful in the way he planned. It is George against the world, a world that only ever opposes him and makes clear his impotence to control it. But of course, it is George, George's own virtues that have led to his frustration. George is truthful, loyal, compassionate, courageous, and committed to doing what is right. It is because of these virtues that his long-held desires have not been satisfied. It is because of these virtues that he has never done anything that, in his own eyes, makes a significant difference in the world. Clarence's remedy is to show George what the world would have been like if he had never been born. George experiences an alternate reality of which he is no part. The bar that George visits is no longer part of Martin Martini's restaurant. It is Nick's, a honky-tonk that, in Nick's, Nick's words, serves hard drinks for men who want to get drunk fast. Gower, the druggist, is a convicted felon and drunkard, mocked and abused by the people in Nick's bar. Bedford Falls has become Pottersville. The town has changed. Main Street is lined with nightclubs, bars, liquor stores, pool halls. The building and loan is no more. Ernie, the taxi driver, does not live in Bailey Park with his wife and child. He lives in Potter's Field, and his wife left him years ago and took the child with her. Bert, the friendly cop, seems to rely more on, for more on force than he did in the world of George. Ma Bailey, George's mother, is hard and suspicious. She does not look like the same woman. Uncle Billy has been in an insane asylum ever since the building and loan went out of business. There's a headstone for Harry Bailey in the cemetery. He drowned in 1919 and so never received the Congressional Medal of Honor for saving the lives of soldiers on the transport. Mary is an old, an old maid library. There are no children, no Pete. Janie, Tommy, or Susie. Clarence tells George, you really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? George recognizes this and tearfully prays to have his old life restored. When this prayer is granted, he runs back through the streets of Bedford Falls, no longer Pottersville, shouting Merry Christmas at everyone he sees. He arrives home and well, we all know the rest. So back to my rules for watching movies. First rule, look and receive. What is the film showing us? There are several things we can identify. First, from prayers and angels at the beginning of the film to a funny looking little guardian angel and the supernatural provision of an alternate reality at the end of the film. It seems that the film wants to show us that there is a transcendent reality that frames our lives and that cares about what we do with our lives. Now, this is not a highbrow film about or of theology, but it is a film that has a theology that shapes it. It aims to show us something about the divine, especially about providence. Second, the film shows us a world in which there is much good in people and shows us that people have an intrinsic dignity that ought to be respected and supported. These are ordinary people living ordinary lives and trying to do the best they can to provide a good home for their family 
and a good community where their children and the weakest and poorest will be nurtured and protected. And there is genuine friendship. When word gets out that friend and neighbor George Bailey is in trouble, family, friends, and neighbors all rush to help. Third, the film reminds us of both some good news and some bad news. To explain this, it helps to know a bit about the origin of the story of It's a Wonderful Life. The film story is based on a short story by Philip Van Doren Stern, the greatest gift, A Christmas Day. The story first came to Stern in a dream in 1938, and he couldn't stop thinking about it, and so he wrote it up in 1939, kept working on the story, and in the mid, uh, well, excuse me, 1943, he sent it around to publishers, nobody wanted it, and so he printed up 200 copies, right, and sent them out with Christmas cards, um, this is how the story goes, and um, going out in the Christmas cards, it came to the attention of the white publisher. And then it came to the attention of Hollywood. And Republic Pictures wound up with the rights to buy the story. And Stern's story became the basis for It's a Wonderful Life. <clears throat> but if we go back to 1938, we learn that Stern attributed his dream, the dream that started it all, to the influence of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, a story that is one of my favorites at any time of year. A Scrooge, Dickens writes, oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sin. Hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained and solitary as a minister. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait. Of course, who does that sound like? Um, so, in A Christmas Carol, Dickens draws this sharp contrast between the wealthy, solitary, misanthropic Scrooge and his clerk, or social family man, Bob Cratchit. Now, given, Dickens gives us very little characterization of Cratchit, but what little is there presents him as a generous and cheerful spirit. And he's even going to toast, right, Scrooge at Christmas dinner. It's a Wonderful Life presents us with a very similar pair of characters. There's Mr. Potter in the role of Scrooge and George Bailey in the role of Bob Cratchit. But whereas A Christmas Carol fleshes out Scrooge, It's a Wonderful Life really does not flesh out Mr. Potter's character. We have no idea why he is so mean and grasping and bitter. But we do know why George Bailey is the way he is. We see that he has been raised to do his duty, to do what is right for family, friends, and neighbors, even if it means the postponement and maybe complete non-fulfillment of what he desires to do. So the emphasis in It's a Wonderful Life are reversed from its ancestral the Christmas gift, and this is important. One of the most glorious and remarkable things about a Christmas carol is that it gives us the good news and hope that even the co most covetous old sinner can be rescued and come to repentance. It's a Wonderful Life does not do that. There is no sign that Mr. Potter is going to repent and change his ways. For all we can tell from the film, Mr. Potter keeps the $8,000 that uh, Uncle Billy misplaced. At the end of the story, Potter is sunk even deeper into his greed and misanthropy. His hatred of and malevolence towards George continue on the baby. He swears out the warrant for George's arrest and calls the sheriff to let him know where he can find George and arrest him. What is a wonderful life does give us is the surprising and not entirely welcome news that even the best of us needs to be rescued, needs to be converted. George Bailey is clearly a very good man. Yes, he has his struggles, but he is the kind of man one would want for a friend, a neighbor, a relative. But there is a darkness in George that is twisting as Potter correctly sees. George lashes out at the crummy old town that he falls. He lashes out at Uncle Billy. He lashes out at his children and wife. He lashes out at innocent neighbors like Mrs. Welch. His suppressed frustration and anger have prevented him from seeing that he has built bridges and built important buildings. So how well has It's a Wonderful Life done what it set out to do? 
on the assumption that I have correctly identified at least part of what the film was trying to do. It seems to me to have done a pretty good job. Yes, there are characters we might like to see develop more fully. How did Potter get this way? What enables Mary Hatch, the true hero, Samwise Gamgee, Gamgee in my opinion, of the film, what enables her to see who George is and what he can become? What are the resources that enable her to deal with this man who is so deeply at war with himself? Moreover, the alternate reality device employed in the film, that is the supernatural provision of a reality where George has never been born, is perfectly in line with what the film is trying to show. So the film succeeds in what it is trying to show. As for the question of whether the film is trying to do or show what it, what it, what it is trying to do or show is worth doing, I think the answer is yes. There are truth and goodness and beauty in the film. And reminding us of these things, showing them to us, is always worthwhile. The film is very humane in affirming a transcendent reality, the struggles of being a flawed, even if very good, even if very good human being. And to paraphrase C.S. Lewis again, the possibility of accepting the good that is given and not demanding the good that was expected. So at this point, turn briefly to everything, every whole, everything at once. Okay, so you know, you figured out by now, I think one film succeeds. I just told you what that film was. I don't think uh, e -E -A -O, <clears throat> excuse me, succeeds. So many of you will have seen um, EEAO, which was nominated for 11 Academy Awards. It won seven of those awards, including Best Picture and Best Director. The film is colorful, energetic, funny, and inventive. The performances in the film are excellent. In many ways, it is a very fine film indeed. But in the end, I do not think that it works. In order to understand why I think this, we need first to remind ourselves very briefly of the story. The film focuses on the members of the Wong family, the mother, Evelyn, and the father, Wayman, are first-generation Chinese immigrants, owners of the laundry. Their daughter, Joy, was born in this country and is losing contact with much of her ancestral culture. Also present in the home is Evelyn's estranged father, Gong Gong, who years ago tried to dissuade Evelyn from leaving for America with Wayman. She was giving up on her dreams, her future. And Evelyn is afraid that her father was right all those years ago. Gong Gong has just arrived for what appears to be his first visit to his daughter and son-in-law. The other major character is Deirdre Bobirdra, an IRS agent. That was a fun name. As mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the Wong family is in crisis. In fact, they are involved in multiple crises. The family business is being audited by Deirdre from the IRS, and Deirdre is frustrated by the fact that Evelyn seems not to be listening to her, her questions, her instructions, her attempts to help her. Waymond is trying to talk with Evelyn about a divorce because he feels that she does not listen to him uh, and that they have grown distant. Joy is alienated from her mother, who seems only to criticize her and the choices she makes while never really listening to her. So Evelyn is at the center of all these crises. The film opens with a shot of a mirror in which we see reflections of the Wong family together in their apartment above the laundromat. These reflections seem to be of better times in the past, but the camera pushes through the mirror to bring us to the present. So we've gone through the looking. The screenplay says that the apartment is a still life of chaos, which might be an understatement. Gong Gong has arrived in Hong Kong the evening before, and the Wongs are preparing a Chinese New Year, New Year party for this evening as a way of honoring him. Before the party, however, Evelyn and Wayman have to meet with Deirdre Bobirdra at the local IRS office. When Evelyn, Wayman, and Gong Gong get into the elevator to go to Deirdre's office, Wayman undergoes a metamorphosis. He still looks like Wayman, of course, but he will identify himself as Wayman from Alpha Universe, a parallel universe in the multiverse. So now we're dealing with Alpha Wayman. He needs Evelyn's help. 
it seems that the Evelyn in his universe, that is Alpha Evelyn, was able to prove the existence of other universes and discovered a way to link her consciousness with versions of herself in other universes. This was called verse jumping, which Alpha Evelyn trained others to do. The idea seemed to be that the other uh, universes in the multiverse would have solved many of the problems confronting the Alpha universe, and that if these universes could communicate with each other, the problems of all the universes could be solved. One of Alpha Evelyn's students had exceptional potential as a verse jump, but Evelyn pushed her beyond her limits and thereby damaged her. Now this former student experiences every universe, every possibility at the same time. That's everything everywhere all at once. She is an omniversal being who commands the infinite knowledge and power of the universe. She's God. She is known as Jobo Topaki. And Alvin Wayman says, says of her that she's seen too much, lost any sense of morality, any belief in objective truth. She is an, uh, an agent of pure chaos. Jobo is building a bagel with everything, at the heart of which is a black hole that will sulk will suck worlds into itself. She goes from universe to universe, killing the Evelyn in each because she knows no matter how powerful she is, or no matter how unlikely it is, in an infinite number of universes, there has to be one where someone can stop her. Alpha Wayman believes that Evelyn in this universe is the one who can stop the omniversal Jogi, who turns out to be Joy. The action of the film is largely the battle then between Jobu and her minions on the one hand and Alpha Wayman, Evelyn, and their forces on the other. Evelyn wants both to stop Jobu's destruction of the multiverse and to rescue Jobu herself. By the end of the film, Evelyn is reconciled to her family. She listens to Wayman and he no longer wants a divorce. Um, she comes to appreciate Wayman's gentle ways. Evelyn listens to Joy, and the two of them are reconciled. Evelyn no longer just tolerates Joy's girlfriend, Becky, but actually acknowledges her and begins to treat her as a family member. Gong Gong seems to be reconciled to Evelyn and Evelyn to Gong Gong. Evelyn even develops a grudging respect for Deirdre Bobirdre, becoming her lover in one of the alternate realities. The black hole bagel has been avoided. Now, what is the film trying to show us? On the one hand, the film seems to be saying that in a, in a universe, anything that happens in a particular universe, anything that we do in our universal universe is, as several characters say at one time or another, a statistical inevitability. The implication is, as Jobu says, that nothing matters. If nothing matters, then all of the pain and guilt that you have for making nothing of your life, it goes away too, sucked into a baby. Tobo also says, see how everything is just a random re rearrangement of particles in a vibrating superposition? Everything we do just gets washed out in the sea of every other possibility. Tobo continues, who knows what great new discovery is coming next to make us feel like even smaller pieces of extra. This is nihilism. This is nothingism but the film does not end it. Against this nihilism is pitted Wayman, who begs, please, can we just stop fighting? He blames the fighting on fear and confusion and says that the only thing I do know is we have to be kind. Be kind, especially when we don't know what's going on. The answer to nihilism, to ultimate meaninglessness, is listening to others and being kind. Now, is the problem of nihilism worth showing to us? Is its proposed response to nihilism at all adequate? The film's response. Is the film trying to do something worth like doing? Well, on the one hand, it seems to me worthwhile, excuse me, <clears throat> seems to me worthwhile to get people to think about these matters in a way that is entertaining, if, even if somewhat uh, chaotic. On the other hand, the film's proposed solution to the problem seems extraordinarily weak. 
In fact, the mechanism that the film uses to raise questions about meaning and purpose in a multiverse undercuts the proposed solution. There's a fundamental inconsistency in the film. The proposed solution is that we should listen and talk to others and that we should be kind. I believe listening, talking, and being kind are certainly good things to do and do. But in the multiverse the film presents, I prefer the film's proposed solution to Jobu's, the Jobu solution. If it is all truly meaningless, there can be no reason for preferring one solution rather than another. There can be no reason for choosing kindness. There can be no reason for saying that we ought to choose kindness. We might think that we are somehow freely choosing to listen and to be kind, but if the multiverse mechanism that drives the film is reality, and if the film's interpretation of that reality is correct, then our choice, any choice, is just a statistical inevitability. There is no good or bad, right or wrong, ought or ought not to it. Creating and falling into the black hole bagel is on a par with listening, loving, and being kind statistical inevitability. Contrast this with It's a Wonderful Life, which presents us with a world framed by a transcendent reality. George lives in a world governed by divine providence in which his decisions really mean something and can be judged as better or worse, right or wrong, good or bad. It makes sense to say that George's life is a gift and that he has actually lived a wonderful life. Evelyn, on the other hand, lives in a meaningless multiverse where it is a statistical inevitability that she chooses listening, talking, and being kind. It is also a statistical inevitability that there is some universe in which she chooses not to listen, not to talk, not to be kind. It is a statistical inevitability that there is a universe where Evelyn plays the part of, shall we say, Hannibal Lecter and eats Wayman. It is a statistical inevitability that there is a universe where Wayman is Hannibal Lecter. So, I think that Evelyn is more humane than she has any right to be in the universe of which she is a part. She acts as though she's in George Bailey's universe. Good for her. The film actually winds up operating as if it is in George Bailey's universe. Good for the film. Good for the directors, the Daniels. The truth is that no one can actually live a human life in the Daniels multiverse. There is no wonderful life in the Daniels multiverse. There is just statistical inevitable. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, again, thanks for coming. I really appreciate you being here. I want to let you know that um, this is event number one in a series, and the question is, who has the stamina to do it all through? Uh, tomorrow night, we have a free screening of the film that has been alluded to in a couple of times, Run, Load, and Run, a uh, kind of a short classic cinnamon filler film that uh, I don't want to leave the music box to reality to explore questions that are really the sort of questions that Competition heads about problems, free will, determinism. That's over in the Tennis and our Twitter down in the basement. Wednesday night, a student panel on multiverses with presentations from four students, Regan Zagatu and one student from Whitler. That's over in the Georgia of Chicago. And then uh, later in the week, we have two more public talks by special invited speakers uh, on Thursday back here in Wolf Auditorium. Uh, again, uh, our, our speaker's gonna have to wrap up. He's got a little bit different uh, case where he's reading the film. Uh, and then on Friday, uh, the talk of the theater, if you heard the word multiverse, and then you saw it the market, that the market the first, the it's a um, the graph I read is a description of how comics and uh, superhero films that you use to uh, work through a plot line for a variety of different things. 
So I hope you'll come back and uh, and uh, join us again for one or more of these other events later. We thank you again for coming.